Well, grace is yours and also peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, by the power of His Holy Spirit, who weaves us together as the family of God through faith in Christ. Amen. Reckless mercy. Reckless not in the sense of uh, irresponsible, but reckless in the sense of generous. It's crazy generous. More generous than you can imagine. Reckless mercy. It's been a crazy couple of weeks, hasn't it? Listen to the news. Charlottesville opens up some old wounds. Maybe wounds that you've never experienced, but still old wounds for our nation. Ancient wound of, wound of racism. Judging a person according to the color of their skin, or judging a person from their uh, family of origin. What would it be like if we lived according to God's Word? You know, God said back in the Garden of Eden, some of the earliest words of Scripture, let us make man in our own image, in the image of us let us make man. And so every human being, well none of us are God unless we're deluded, we share in some aspect of the image of God. The knowledge, though corrupted by sin. A desire for holiness, though corrupted by sin, big time. A desire for community and relationship, though corrupted by sin. A concept of love, but corrupted by sin and turn inward. What would happen if we began to look at ourselves as people who are created in the image of God? People who, who, you know, we were an idea in God's mind before we were conceived. We were loved by God before we were loved by our parents. So what if we looked at ourselves as people in the image of God and valuable to Him? And what would happen in a society if we saw other people also created in the image of God. That other people, regardless of their skin tone, regardless of their family of origin, regardless of their, you know, history, and we looked at them and we said, that person was God's idea. And God doesn't have any bad ideas. What happened? What would it look like? We're going into a text of Scripture that talks about racism and how Jesus deals with racism in the lives of His disciples because He's, uh, he's on a collision course. He's been in collision already with uh, some Jewish leaders, some uh, Pharisees, and you know how the Pharisees are, teachers of the law. They came from Jerusalem and they confronted Jesus early in chapter 15. And he said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Oh my goodness, evil, evil disciples, they're not washing their hands properly. I don't know, I think these Pharisees need to get a life. Don't you? And then I look at those Pharisees and I say, those bad Pharisees, they're so legalistic and they shouldn't be legalistic. And I get so legalistic about them not being legalistic that I can become what? Legalistic. I can become Pharisaical about not being Pharisaical. And I get all messed up. But the point is, by the way, we've got to pray for the people at the 815 worship service, 830 worship service. I mean, it was a sermon, but I don't know. This is my first time through it, so it should be better this time. So let's, let's take a moment, pray for them, that Spirit worked in their lives anyway, okay? But, but so the Pharisees are, are questioning Jesus' authority. They're questioning, they, they want to cast Him out. They want to they, they wanna reject Him. And He's come for them, and, and they're rejecting Him. And so Jesus kind of just kind of throws up His hands here in, in chapter 15, and He starts walking. He starts walking, and that's where our text picks up. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew away from the Pharisees, away from the, uh, you know, the, 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 the religious crazy people. Okay, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
Now, Tyre and Sidon are, is the, the property of Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And you know what the Jews thought about Gentiles? They're just a bunch of stray dogs. They're just awful. They're wild animals. They're not to be trusted. And Jesus starts walking toward the region of Tyre and Sidon. So he's had a collision with the Jewish leaders, and now he's on a collision course with Gentiles, and in particular, a Canaanite woman. It says, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. From demon possession. So Jesus wasn't at Tyre and Sidon. He was walking toward it. She came from that border area. She had somehow heard about Jesus because she calls on him, doesn't call him Jesus, says, Lord, son of, you got to keep up, people, David. That's his messianic title. This Canaanite woman, not a Jew, not a Hebrew, she knew that there was going to be a Savior coming from the line of David for the Jewish people. Living in that vicinity, she'd heard about this Jesus, this teacher, this healer, and she calls on him by his messianic name, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. So she comes. Jesus ignores her. You see, this whole event is an illustration of the message Jesus wants his disciples to get. And the message is this, the gospel, the good news of God's invading love in the world of sinful mankind, God's gospel is not just for the Jewish people, but it's also for all nations. God had already spoken this back in Genesis chapter 315 when he said, the seed of the woman, the seed of Eve, will crush the head of Satan and Satan will bruise his heel. It wasn't just for Eve, it was for all people. He makes the promise to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to choose you and I'm going to bless you so that you can be fat, dumb, and happy. Is that what he said? No. What he said was this, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and make you a father of a great nation so that through you I can bless all nations. God has always had the plan that by blessing Israel, he might bless all nations. And though the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, would come through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and King David, he would send Jesus through that line. It was in order to bless all nations. The woman gets it. Peter doesn't get it. The disciples don't get it. God was calling them to understand this. That The gospel comes to the Jew first and also to the Greeks, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. God's call. Where's God at work today? Is he at work in the United States? You really see congregations growing, thousands of people coming to faith in Christ every day. You see that in the United States? I see the church declining in the United States. The church has kind of become fat, dumb, and happy. We take care of ourselves. But you know where the church is growing by leaps and bounds, where the Spirit of God is at work in bringing people to faith in Christ? South of the equator and the Eastern Hemisphere, throughout Africa, Kazakhstan, India, Pakistan, usually in places where Christians are being persecuted and even put to death for their faith. That's where God's Spirit is at work. I don't know about you, but I would like to be faithful to God and witness as much as I can to people without the persecution. Thank you very much. But if that's what it takes to bring about the work of God, then let's allow the persecution to come. But God is at work. God is at work. It's spilling over into other cultures and other nations moving away from the Western Hemisphere. God has bound himself to his plan. Through Israel, I will bless all nations. But, he, but his plan does not bind him. He's going to act in any way he wants to. 
Secondly, I want you to see that Jesus is intentionally reckless with, with the mercy of God by his words. The disciples do not want to see him. They come up to Jesus and they say, uh, it says, Jesus didn't answer words, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. I mean, Lord, get rid of her. Get rid of her. Tell her to go away because people are going to talk. You, you, we don't want this, this raggy woman dragging after us. Get rid of her. She's a, she's a Gentile. She's a Canaanite. She's unclean. And Jesus answered, not the woman, but Jesus answered the disciples, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And he just keeps walking. But as he stops and addresses his disciples, the woman catches up and she kneels down before him. Lord, help me, she says. He replies to her, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Does that sound odd coming out of Jesus' mouth? Anybody? Here's this woman begging for her daughter, and Jesus looks at her and says, it's not right to take the food from the children and toss it to their dogs. That doesn't sound like the Jesus I grew up knowing. You? I mean, Jesus I grew up knowing was supposed to love everybody, right? Jesus I grew up knowing was supposed to have curly blonde hair and blue eyes and khaki pants and a polo shirt and lived in the suburbs. Isn't that the Jesus that we worship? He's nice and clean, right? Why would he talk this way to that woman? But the woman gets it. The woman gets it because Jesus uses very particular words. What he's really saying here is this, and this is the translation from the original. It is not the best plan to take the children's bread and toss it to their little dogs, their little pet dogs in their home. He was not calling her a varmint or a wild dog or anything like that. It was a dog that would be in the family's home. And it's not the best plan to take the food away from the children and give it to the dogs, to the little dogs. And the children being the children of Israel. It's not the best plan. In fact, God's perfect plan was to, to bring Israel to himself through Jesus Christ and then bless the world. They rejected him, and so Jesus is going to go to the Gentiles. He goes to plan B, and her response is awesome. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs, even the little pet dogs, the lap dogs, eat the crumbs that are continually falling from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith, your request is granted, and her daughter was healed from that very hour. See, Jesus in his response to her was not rejecting her. He was selecting her, saying, you're not one of the chosen children of Israel, but you're one of God's family anyway. You're in the household, and you will receive this blessing. I will radically and recklessly pour out my mercy on you. The Canaanite woman demonstrates that she understands more than the disciples do. And Jesus would spell this all out in his ascension. As he ascends to the right hand of the Father after his resurrection, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And the word there is ethnic groups. All nations. Not just white people, not just black people but brown and red and yellow and every other color that there might be. All ethnic groups are to come to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and trust in Him for their salvation. And you and I, as instruments of God's grace and His mercy, are to be instruments of that in people's lives. Peter didn't get it until Acts chapter 10, when he meets Cornelius, a Roman centurion who trusts in Jesus. And then Peter says, finally, now I understand that God shows no favoritism, but when anyone calls on his name, he shows mercy. We need to hear this, church. It's not just for us. It's not just for people like us. It's not just for people that you like. It's for people everywhere, the mercy of God. God's people are most like Jesus 
when we are intentionally reckless with God's mercy through our words and actions? What would happen if we realized how much mercy God has intentionally, recklessly poured out into our lives, removing our sin, making us His own, that we would look at His cross and we would say, there at the cross, God poured out His love for me. My sins are washed free, washed away, rather. And and then at at the resurrection, that resurrection is for me, that I too am raised by Christ through my baptism. God has been merciful to me. What would happen if we really understood that for ourselves? Wouldn't that pour out on other people? I would think. And what what if we really showed mercy to one another in the family of God, in the church? So much so that it became our our native tongue, and we got so well practiced at showing mercy to one another in the church, we began to show mercy to one another outside the church, in our communities, in our world. In our workplaces. What would happen if we showed mercy in our families, in our marriages? and our children, and raising them, and we got so practiced at that that it kind of bled over into our neighborhoods and into our workplaces. What would it look like? There's a crazy story in the Old Testament, one of my favorites. It's about a guy named Mephibosheth. Anybody know Mephibosheth? It's just a fun word to say, isn't it? You should name your kid Mephibosheth. It's just, you know, he'd be messed up for life, but at least, you know, he would know this story. Uh, But Mephibosheth, uh, he's a cripple, okay? And he got crippled when his nurse picked him up when he was a little boy and started running, and she tripped and fell and broke his legs, okay? And the reason that she picked him up to run was because she was afraid that King David's men were going to come and kill Mephibosheth, because Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, the previous king. And in the ancient world, the new king that came into power usually would just kill all the other family members of the previous king. Got it? So she acted appropriately in her line of thinking. But pick up the story several years later. David, the king, says this, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul? to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And one of the servants comes up and says, well, there's a guy named Mephibosheth down south. He's at Lodabar. By the way, the city Lodabar, you know what that word means? Oh, you don't know. I'll tell you. I won't charge any extra for this. Lodabar means no voice. So here's Mephibosheth, weird name, in a city that says no voice. He has no voice before the king. So Mephibosheth is brought before the king, and what's he thinking? What's Mephibosheth thinking? Right? That's what he's thinking. So he comes limping in. And the king says, Mephibosheth! And Mephibosheth says, your servant. And the king says, Hey, you're Jonathan's son. Welcome. I'm going to give you back all your grandfather's property. Uh, Mephibosheth says, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? A dead dog. I'm as good as dead. And David says, "Uh, You don't get this. You don't get it. I want to bless you. I want to show mercy to you. And for the rest of your life, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat at my table. You're going to eat at the king's table. And so every night, you know, dinner bell would ring at the castle, I guess. I'm making this up, right? Right? I'm just thinking. They probably got a dinner bell. They're ringing the dinner bell uh, at at the castle, uh, the palace of David in in Jerusalem. And uh, everyone's gathering around the big table, the king's feast. and, And you hear coming down the hall. Is Mephibosheth making his way to the king's table. Uh, you just picture that? You and me today coming here to the Lord's Supper, receive the very body and blood of Jesus given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. We bring absolutely nothing to the table. You bring nothing to the table. You're just walking up there like this. Right? Because we're all crippled. Sin has crippled us. But God raises us up. We're all dead dogs but he welcomes us to the table. We're all like the Canaanite woman. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And he says, come, come. 
I'll show mercy. And we receive. We receive what God has. It's all in Jesus. His cross covers our sin. His resurrection gives us life. It's all here for you. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you show mercy to us. Reckless mercy. Uh, we ask that you'd help us to be your instruments of mercy in the lives of other people. Help us to, to look past anything that would deter us from, from loving them and just seeing them as people that you created, people that you love, people that you want into your kingdom. Your word tells us that you desire all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And then you told us that, that you're my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the remotest parts of the world. Help us, Father, to be those witnesses, to show that kind of mercy, just to be reckless with it. Not irresponsible, but reckless, just generous with your mercy that others would know you because they know us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.